This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. This is why the Nkunguma Pride is such a firm favourite. He just looks ready for a fight. This is still her territory. The Avoca boys are here to stay. Ooh. How insane was that? Good afternoon. What a way to start the 12th episode of Safari Lives. That there is Guchava, the female leopard. We'll tell you a little bit about the contretemps she had. Did you like that, Sebastian? The contretemps she had this morning with her mother. Yes, it was with her mother and with her consort. Uh, Sebastian Rombi is on uh, camera. That's who I was talking to, in case you thought I was talking to no one in particular. Please talk to us over the course of this next Highlights Package show. Two hours of action-packed highlights from the Masai Mara in Kenya and, of course, the Sabi Sands here in South Africa. And, of course, also some live action. What we have over there, like I said, is Guchava, the female leopard. She who is afraid, apparently, is what it means. We're going to go around to the other side at some stage and enjoy her, or enjoy her face rather than just the back of her head. Like I say, please talk to us using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, otherwise you can talk to us using the chat stream on YouTube. Any of your questions or comments would be hugely appreciated. Tristan is going to unpack what happened around this area this morning. Quite an astonishing thing where basically all of our cat characters of Juma were sat underneath the same tree in the same sighting so that was very special we'll get some updates from the mara as i said uh, we've had the lions obviously they've been knocking about the place cheetah as well and the inimitable north clan of hyena also over here the main feature of course has been tingana the male leopard we've seen him i think just about every single day this week so there's lots to have a look at over the course of the next two hours and it's wonderful to have you with us here uh, it began for me with tingana in the morning light the duke has had a busy week in the eastern section of his territory his forays have been an exercise in forensic foraging, you might say scavenging. But this word has a negative connotation, implying the brutish theft of another predator's meals. Tingana's efforts were a severe test of leopard olfactory skills. His sharp nose twice led him to kills made by a pack of two female wild dogs. In this case, the remains of an impala which he stashed in a picturesque Tambuti grove. So that was the first, first, pe, first, first part of Tingana's busy week. Here we are a little bit closer now to Guchava. We haven't got quite round the other side. We will do so in due course. Is she not magnificent? This is the quintessential African leopard shot. Let's keep going a little bit. Patrick, you say you love Guchava. I think we all do, and I think we all would rather spend a lot more time with her than we manage at the moment. The only reason we don't spend more time with her, of course, is because she spends the bulk of her time to the south and east of where we are. That's south and east of Juma. Uh, Patrick, we don't know where the cub is, but the cub is old enough not to be in any danger. In other words, she'll be stashed away safely somewhere, and it's not unusual for this leopard to be spending a little bit of time away from her cub. Let's just move into this little spot here, and you'll get an amazing view. Oh, now, naturally, she's turned her head the other way. There we go. Please don't look that way, my dear. I mean, that probably is the best way for the light, but why well, you've chosen to do it now? Possibly should have stayed exactly where we were. Anyway, we're going to try and convince her to turn her head this way. In the meantime, Tristan has been unable to cope with all of the action here this morning, and so he has taken to sitting on the floor. Indeed, James, this morning was just too much, and so I've decided that I, I can't mobilize either on my feet 
or in a vehicle. And so I've decided to sit on the floor and to just enjoy the afternoon and take it very, very easy. No, we're not on the floor for that reason. We're on the floor because we have a situation where we are trying to find little Clalumba from this morning. So we were here earlier this morning. We managed to find her and have a really good sighting of her. But we're trying now just to see if we can find some tracks and just try and see exactly where she's gone. And we found one little track, and it's really tough here because her foot is very, very small. And so if I put my hand next to it, you might not even be able to see this track. But at the back here, we've got this kind of little three-lobed pad and then these tiny little toes that are over there. So it is very, very, very minute. And on this sort of hardish ground, it's quite difficult to actually see where she's walked. So we've come to where I had her last. And this was the track that she went to before she lay down and kind of curled up into a little ball when we left her. So this is kind of our starting point, And this is where we'll try and see if we can find little Clalumba this afternoon. Now, the thing is with her is that she was a little bit skinny this morning. And she was kind of hoping to find some food and, and, and hoping for mom to come back and hopefully bring her something so she's going to be probably still somewhere in this area unless Tundi did return and then in which case we'll hopefully find Tundi's tracks but while we sit here and we try and see if we can find our little character that is moving about up in the Mara Jamie's been having a lot more of a good time than what we have Last week, we were witness to the somewhat distressing scene of the happy zebra hyena clan catching and killing a baby buffalo from this exact herd, something that they have become specialists in, in the valleys around the Salt Lake. Now, oh, before they could finish their hard-earned meal, the sausage tree pride of lions came in and stole it from them. Now, that seems to be something that would be considered quite unusual. Nobody really expects lions to steal from hyenas, but that is what they do very regularly, particularly if they're male lions involved. Unfortunately for the Oweno pride, they didn't have any males with them when they caught their buffalo meal of the week. A new day dawned bright and clear in the Masai Mara, and the Owino Pride were finally successful in their quest for a meal. The hunting skill of the formidable females ensured that all bellies were filled to bursting point. As night fell, the smell of the buffalo attracted unwanted attention, and eerie rallying cries turned the meal into a battleground between two forces of nature. The Owino Pride's second attempt to reclaim lost ground was met by an impenetrable defensive line of teeth. Outnumbered and at risk of serious injury, the lions were forced to surrender. And within minutes, the hysterical cackles calmed and the victorious hyena made short work of the spoils of war. An unlucky night for the Owino pride, but perhaps not as unlucky as the poor hapless buffalo that was devoured. The interesting thing about that particular sighting was it was around about 300 or 400 meters from the North Clan den site. That's actually why Tristan and myself sat out there, because it was very much a, a teamwork-based sighting. Tristan was there the entire day. We joined him a little bit later. The reason that we did that was because we assumed that North Clan would come in and be the ones to steal from the Owino. It was only when I went back and looked through the footage later that I realized the error of that assumption because it was not North Clan, it was the Happy Zebra Clan. How that happened, what they were doing there, probably close on 25 kilometers away from the center of their territory, I have absolutely no idea. Could it be that the Happy Zebra Clan have tired of hunting this herd of buffalo and are in search of greener pastures? Well, wasn't that just absolutely amazing? Jamie had an incredible sighting. And actually, funny enough, I was in that same sighting with her when I was up in the Mara in the beginning of the week. And it was really quite something to watch the sort of uh, Winnie Pride 
and the sort of hyenas coming in and trying to chase these lions off the kill. Well, not trying, they successfully tried to do it and, and did it and took the meal. It was really quite something to watch. The interesting thing about it is we sat there for the whole day. So we were there about, I would say, probably about 16 hours when before the hyenas arrived. And when we got there, you know, there was nothing really happening, and, and late into the night, we still hadn't seen much. One hyena tried to be brave and came in early in the sort of afternoon and was very quickly sort of vanquished by the lions. And then, you know, we were about to actually leave the sighting. And as I drove out onto the road, all these eyes just appeared down the road, and it was about sort of eight hyenas. And we thought, well, this is going to be the start of it. And the hyenas went towards the carcass, and only actually three broke off towards the carcass. And then what we had was just the most incredible thing is all of a sudden, one vocalization, and there was 20 hyenas where they came from we have no idea we could not see them at all prior to that they all kind of just stood out of the grass and then rushed in and kind of chased off their winyo pride now Sinak, you were saying you don't know much about the winyo pride and, and where are they, do they come from and do we know anything about them well the winyo pride is basically what we used to call the little sausage tree pride so they're a break off from the sausage tree pride and are, are sort of part of that but what we think is that when they had their cubs which some of you may remember from last year it was the, the set of cubs that had the very pale individual in there they might have had their cubs with different males to what the sausage, big sausage tree pride has had. And so therefore it's meant that the females have kind of split off and had to go off on their own to take their cubs to keep them safe. We also know that Kinky Tail was part of attacking those little babies at, at one point. And so maybe the females just thought, well, we're going to be threatened by this big pride. We're going to break off onto our own. And so two females left with their three offspring. And that's what the Awinio pride has become. Now, the reason they called the Awinio pride and not the little sausages is because it gets very confusing when you start to have a situation where you've got sausage tree pride, little sausage tree pride, and no one really knows what's going on. And they spend a lot of their time in an area that's called the Awinio tree plain. And so basically it's right up against the escarpment and it kind of goes towards this road that we call the escarpment road. And it runs sort of from south of Engama all the way down to about the 50 kilometer sign. And they spend most of their time there and they like to actually often climb in Awinio trees. And so it seems like an appropriate name for them and it kind of works out in the way that you, you sort of know where they are and, and what the sort of pride composition is so that's the little bit of their sort of backstory they're an incredible group of lionesses for me they're one of the sort of prides that I've really enjoyed sort of spending time with and I'll tell you why it's because two of them to bring down big adult buffalo like they do is absolutely insane. It, for me, it's an amazing thing to see two lionesses bringing down buffalo. We know it's a very difficult thing. And the, the reason why they're able to do it is because both of those females are large individuals. The one is seriously muscular, and the other one is built a bit like a male. She's very, very big. She's much bigger than any of the other lions that I saw while I was in the Mara. So they're an interesting kind of pride, and, and they certainly have found themselves in a great place to be able to find buffalo and all kinds of other things. And they certainly going to be a big part of the next sort of few years and hopefully around the hyena den well the northland den there's going to be a lot of sort of interaction there because of where they are good we're going to carry on we're going to try and track Klalamba, who tracks head off in this direction while we do that we're going to send you across to big biceps byron so he can say good afternoon to all of you Good afternoon. I hope you are all having a wonderful day so far. My name is Byron and on camera with me this afternoon is Craig. Now it's amazing. James has been very fortunate. He's found that female leopard. Now we are in search of some other animals in this area and I think I have just seen a paw in the grass. Give us a second. Stay with us. This is really exciting. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Now the grass, if you have a look and scan, it's very, very thick. And what I caught a glimpse of, I can actually see it there now. Watch out, Craig, with these branches. Can you get that? Have a look here. There you can just see a rather large paw. Look at that. Now I'm going to move a bit closer. Let's get a better view and see exactly what it is. I've got a feeling it's a male lion's. Oh, now it's quite thick through here with a little bit of a drainage line. Oh this is going to be difficult. Um, hold on. This is the tough part of getting closer to these animals. But don't worry, we've got a good vehicle. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Let's see, oh dear. 
<laughs> Hold on. Oh wow, look, look, Craig. Yeah, that's a male lion. There's at least two, I think three. These are the Voca males. Wonderful, wonderful. I have not seen them before. This is the first time I get to see these male lions. That's great. I will definitely try to get better views of them. But for now, you can see they are lying down. They're out in the open, fortunately. They're not right at the base of a thicket or or um, under a tree. They are out in the open, but the grass is fa fairly long around them. But how wonderful is that? That's a great find. That's awesome. I'm so glad we found them. All right, I'm going to try get into a better position to view these lions. Um, but while I do that, let's quickly go back to the dark maned male Tristan. Well, Byron, I feel like you, you, you and your sort of heritage will have a much darker mane than I would, although it's, mine is quite dark. But I feel like there's a lot of gray hairs creeping in at these days, and so that's not ideal at all. But anyway, besides that, we're still carrying on on the tracks. We're still trying to kind of work out what's going on. We actually did find a track just now. It looks like maybe the Tundi actually came back at some point during the day and might have fetched Clalumba. So we're going to just check it out and make 100% sure, try to find a little bit more of an open area. You can see here there's quite a lot of grass cover which makes it very very difficult and it makes it hard to find so we'll just try and find a bear patch which we call a kind of a track trap and try and see if we can find those tracks over there now this morning when we were trying to kind of be out and we were testing the drone we were trying to sort of find any sign of any animal whatsoever and we were lucky enough able to hear some impalas and the impalas actually led us to the very cat that we're trying to find now Beautiful Clalumba sits posing atop a small termite mound, her piercing gaze watching our every move. Soon she grows bored of us and begins to move off. She briefly climbs a small broken log and stares into the distance. She has spotted something and suddenly moves forward, carefully placing each foot in front of the other. To our surprise, a big grey giant appears from the thickets, its short trunk and her herd. They begin feeding as they pass by. Columba, meanwhile, completely disinterested, finds herself a cozy patch in order to rest for the rest of the day. Well, this is the exact spot that we managed to find her this morning. So she was sitting atop this mound, kind of being as cute as could be. She really is an amazing little leopard. I've thoroughly enjoyed seeing her this morning. I was absolutely blown away at just how big she's gotten. The last time I saw her, she must have been at least half the size of what she is now. Now she's starting to look like a real leopard and not this sort of a cubby kind of character that we were seeing a few months ago. She's also filled out a little bit. She's no longer as wiry. I find leopard cubs, when they sort of hit that four to sort of eight month phase, they often their legs are quite long, they're quite narrow. They don't really have that sort of bulky leopard feel to them that an adult has got. So she's filled out a lot more. She's starting to look a lot more like a proper leopard now and I'm sure she's going to just provide us with many many sightings to come now what I was saying earlier today that I'm pretty sure she'll be in this area unless Tundi comes back to fetch her now this morning Sydney was out and about and he had an absolutely insane morning and he managed to bump into Tundi and I'm pretty sure if Tundi's come back we know the reason why Alert Tandy sits motionless in the long grass, her gaze focused and ears twitching. She has spotted something that all leopards fear most, lions. It's the Avoca males, and they have seen Tandy too. They both freeze as though time stands still, each cat weighing up its next move. Tandy is the first one to break, and she runs. Thankfully, though, the avocas seem disinterested and allow Tandy to slink away into the thick bush. One male, however, keeps an eye out, and after a few sniffs of the breeze, is up dragging his coalition members with him as he follows his nose in the direction of where Tandy disappeared.
Well, as you can see, Tandi was incredibly lucky, and I am absolutely surprised after watching some of the footage that those lines did not move. I would have thought if those three males had been that close to Tandi that they were definitely going to try and chase her. And I know many other lines that are in this area, including the Birmingham boys and Inkahuma Pride, most definitely would have had they got that close to Tandi. So she got away lightly this morning, and she was really very, very fortunate in that those boys just didn't seem to be interested. And so I wonder why. I mean, I know we know the boys were quite far yesterday and I, I know that because somebody actually saw them in Manuleti yesterday morning and actually watched them then cross back into Manuleti yesterday afternoon from Biffles Hook and then they came all the way back down to the southern parts of Juma so they walked quite a long way yesterday but normally with lions when they come across another leopard they find a situation where they'll sort of, well not another leopard, a leopard, they'll chase it and they it's just this sort of competition that they have with other cats that they try to kind of, you know, get rid of them and, and sort of chase them away. So it's very surprised that she was able to kind of get out of there and I'm sure she breathed a sigh of relief, albeit a very momentarily sort of moment. She would have got herself into a little bit of a tangle a little bit later. Now, I believe a James Henry is sitting with, well, not the offspring that we're looking for, but one of Tundi's others. Well, yes, one of Tundi's offspring indeed. There we have Guchava still sitting on her bow. We've gone around this tree 386 times because she keeps moving her head from side to side. As soon as she realizes there's a lens on her, she turns her head the other day, other way. So we've quite cunningly positioned a whole vehicle full of guests the other side of the tree. And so she now has no choice but to look into a lens wherever she is. I'm, of course, joking. I don't think she notices whether there's a lens faced her way or not. She does keep looking down towards the western side and we're wondering if perhaps one of those other leopards aren't around. No, never too late. Let me assure you that this cat would not be uh, in the tree if she thought she'd fall out of it when she fell asleep. Uh, they definitely do sleep soundly in trees, especially with their legs either side of the bough like that, but often they just doze. So I don't think she's been in a particularly deep sleep while we've been here. I think she has been dozing for most of the time. And, you know, even if she does fall asleep, she'd wake up before she kind of fell out. Otherwise, they wouldn't have developed this ability or this sort of desire to be in trees. And the reason she's up there, of course, is because she's safe now. She's safe from the lions, which are not far from here at all. Byron, I think, has just found them. He may be just still trying to get into a position, but they're not far from here. Tandi and Tingana must be around here somewhere as well. She keeps looking down to the west. I wonder if she's looking at the lions or she's looking at Tandi and Tingana. But really, there has been the most utterly astounding uh, day today. And let's go across to Tristan now so that he can unpack what happened. Indeed, we do need to unpack what happened. But before we do that, we have a little crime scene that we've managed to stumble across. And it's an interesting one because I was talking about this morning with Clalamba and the fact that she'll often hunt little birds at her age and will try and kind of go after birds to find small meals. And this sort of feather pattern that we see here that's all kind of distributed out could very well have been a kill that she might have made. The thing is about this is when you have sort of feathers that are tightly packed the way that these are, so you can see all the feathers are in a very, very close proximity to them to where the, the sort of kill must have happened they haven't drifted her away and that means that whatever ate it ate it on the ground if this had been something like a bird of prey that had been in a tree you would have found as it plucks the feathers you know feathers obviously being very light and designed to catch wind catch wind and they spread over a big distance and so you have a situation where you'll find feathers kind of scattered all around where we are now these are all confined to a very small space so and i wonder if maybe Tlalamba had didn't have a little sort of kill at some point in the last few days and it was a dove or something that was killed in this particular area it's pretty interesting to see and these are the kind of signs that you look for when you're tracking through thicker grass areas you can't always see their footprints but you can sometimes find little signs like this to indicate where they've gone and where they've been. Now, James is saying that we had an insane morning. So, as we finished our drive this morning, we were uh, on our way home before absolute pandemonium broke out down in the south. As if Tandy's morning could not get any worse after running into the Avoca boys, there is now an intruder in her kingdom to deal with. 
The two move swiftly side by side through the thickets. They break cover and we can see it's Kuchaba, Tandi's first daughter. She tries to run from her mother, but Tandi is not in the mood and is out to prove that her daughter is no longer welcome in her territory. Tandi launches at Kuchaba. A small scuffle ensues. Both then start to trot side by side, sizing one another up. Suddenly though, both leopards show a turn of speed and begin to run. The reason becomes obvious as the Avaka boys enter the fray once again. Kuchaba wastes no time and ascends high into a knob for for safety. But unbelievably, there's a twist in this tale yet again. Out of nowhere, Tingana the Duke arrives on the scene, clearly in search of the leopards causing the stir in his area. He tests the air, picking up the female scent, before settling down to rest. However, his rest is short-lived, as once again the Avaka boys arrive and show who is the real king of the big cats. Kuchava, safely perched in the tree, watches as both Tingana and Tangi make a narrow escape. Well, how incredible is that sighting and how lucky have all of our cats been to actually be able to get out of that. I think Tandi, Tingana and um, Kuchava can count themselves very, very fortunate that they didn't get themselves into a massive brawl that resulted in them not paying attention and not seeing those lines. I think they were very lucky that they kind of had a little scuffle and kind of broke apart and were able to see the lines coming. But absolutely insane. Three leopards and three male lions in the same sighting is unheard of. And Sydney, who was actually in the sighting, must have had the most <laughs> ridiculous morning because, you know, he's arrived in the Sabi's hands, taken a game drive, bumped into a leopard which bumped into lions, then stayed with the lions, went back to another leopard, and then there was a three, well, two other leopards arrived, they had a big scuffle, and male lions arrived. It's just a fairy tale kind of start. He's going to have a tough time sort of following that up. But what was really interesting to me in that whole sighting was the way Tandi reacted to Kuchava. You could clearly see when they were running, Kuchava was the individual that was closest to the camera, and Tandi was in the background. And you can see as Kuchava sort of peels away and starts to try and get away from Tandi, she comes flying from this direction, and she's the one that's actually the aggressor that jumps at Kuchava, and they scuffle and then, you know, roll on the ground, and she's actually trying to hit her. It's pretty clear to me that Tandi, even though she's sort of a slight female and she's not the biggest, she packs a serious punch. It's the second time I've seen her fight. It's sort of a similar time last year. I mean, we were a bit of month away from when she sort of fought with Shongile and it's the same situation is that she was not afraid in any way whatsoever to dive in there and to go after whatever female she deemed was a threat to her territory and to her cubs and it's a reason why she's been such a good mother and why she's been able to keep Kalamba safe from all these marauding males as well as even females that have come into this area. The interesting, sort of other interesting part about it was Tingana's response. He kind of came into the area, but once he figured out that it was two females, he settled right down. You can see he started to relax, he started to lie down, he was just watching those two females, just trying to see exactly what they were doing, and he wasn't too fussed once he realized that. I think initially you would have found he probably heard fighting of leopards, and he, to him it must have been maybe there's males around, he needs to go check this out, and he moved very far. He went all the way from the dam this morning and kind of ran that way and you could see he was actually panting at one point trying to kind of catch his breath from being sort of moving so fast trying to catch up with everything so it was a really an insane sighting now Ali it was amazing to have all of this in one morning it was just incredible if you think in total we had four different leopards three male lions herds of elephant it was just absolutely insane everything was kind of happening and everything was interacting with each other and that's one amazing thing about Juma is that the interaction between species as well as between the characters that we follow is really quite something here. It's, it's a, it, probably the Swabi Sands is one of the best places for interaction like this and to be able to see interspecies um, sort of relationships and those kind of things. So it was an insane morning and one that I doubt anyone else will forget. And the best thing about it is that because it was so insane it, and that nobody got hurt, it made it just that much better. So the fact is nobody was injured, nobody Nobody sort of lost their life, and for us then, you know, that's the sort of best scenario that could have played out from a very difficult scene. Good. Well, we're going to keep trying to track down said aggressive lady in the form of Tandi and Tlalamba and see where they've gone. In the meantime, though, we're going to send you, I think, across to Byron and see what he's been up to and whether he's had any success this afternoon. Yep, we've just repositioned and we are still sitting with these beautiful male lions. There's a little bit of movement, but 
they still seem quite relaxed and resting. Now, it is a cooler afternoon, so I wouldn't be surprised if these males decide to get up and start moving a lot earlier than usual because of the cooler temperatures. So that's what I'm hoping for. I'm going to be very, very patient and sit with them. I would love to see these males get up and move around. But this is awesome. And exactly as Tristan was saying, what an exciting morning. All, all this, um, all this action, action-packed morning. Carly, you are very happy to see the evokers. Now, it's always wonderful having male lions moving about. So it is great to see these males. A nice coalition of three. But interesting that behaviour with the leopards. A quick little fight, and then obviously these lions coming through, and the leopards getting out of there as soon as possible, up into trees and just. Um, running away. I mean, they do not want to be surprised by these males. These males would kill a leopard if they did come across it, purely because it's competition. Now these lions are the ones that are responsible for chasing that leopard, that female leopard, Kuchava, up into the tree that James has got. Let's go find out if it's still up there. Well, it is still here, of course, but I think it was probably also its mother that put her up in the tree like this. Certainly she's had a day to remember, and I suspect she will slink off to the south sometime this evening, hopefully back to her safe cub. We hope that the cub is safe, no reason she shouldn't be, or he shouldn't be, as a little male. And she's probably just going to wait for the cover of darkness before she disappears. She looks pretty well fed, so I don't think she's particularly in need of a meal. I think that these female leopards who are in each other's ter territories or, you know, when they come across a territorial boundary like happened this morning, that's what's happened between Tandi and Guchava, uh, I think they'll find that there is a relative aggression, but because they know each other, they're not actually hugely aggressive with each other. And I really don't think that Guchava would necessarily set upon Chalamba should there be a meeting between the two. I think Tlalamba would run uh, and really make an effort to get away very quickly and I don't think that Kuchava would make the effort to push through on that sort of attack. So that's from, I, sorry I'm missing this name here, Bros Cooper is what I can hear, is that correct? No Scooper. No Scooper. Well that's a very interesting name. No Scooper. So no, in short I do not believe that Kuchava would cause Tlalamba any harm, especially if Tandia was around. This whole incident this morning is kind of a, I think a, a random, not a random, but a, a whole lot of serendipity if you like. I think Kuchava and Tandi happened upon the southern boundary of Tandi's territory and the east or western boundary, northwestern boundary of Guchava's territory, they happened to be there around the same time. They met up. The noise that they made, growling at each other and in fact having physical contact, which I say is quite unusual and uh, probably, possibly not unsurprisingly initiated by Tandi, it seems, that would have attracted the lions to come and see what was going on and it would have done exactly the same for Tingana. So I think that the noise that these two ladies made is what attracted Tingana into the area and definitely what attracted the lions. I don't think they were particularly interested. Obviously they would kill these leopards if they could get hold of them, but they certainly didn't make an enormous effort. I've seen lions climb trees after leopards before. So, you know, while they're nowhere near as adept as leopards in trees and that leopards would almost certainly have escaped, if the lions had truly wanted to push home some kind of attack, they would easily have climbed up a tree in order to certainly harass them a little bit further. So that's what's potting over here. Everything seems fairly calm. Tingana down possibly towards Twin Dams, possibly where this leopard is looking, but I'm not really sure. Well, 
the sky. I think if you were a human being and your mother started to hiss and growl at you, it would be deeply confusing and unsettling. But, of course, this is normal with leopards. It's what they do. It's, it's how they operate. It's how they've always operated. And so, as much as it might seem unpleasant that Tandi is hissing and snarling at her daughter, her daughter doesn't want to be around her mother either. So Guchava will, is not, it's not like Guchava is trying to come into this area and say hi to mum or come home in some way. She's marking her territory. She's trying to perhaps push her northwestern boundary out slightly and that's got her into trouble today. Now the only leopard we haven't, well, we haven't managed to find a number of leopards today by ourselves, they've certainly arrived in our sightings, but Tingana has been the main feature of the week, as I said, and uh, his second great incident occurred the afternoon after his impala thieving. With the carcass stashed safely in the shade, Tingana's afternoon began well enough. As he ages, so he likes to spend extended periods resting his eyelids in the winter sun. But the original owners of the impala arrived as dusk fell, most likely on the hunt for something fresh. But as everyone knows, nothing quite gets up the nose of a dog like the smell of a cat. The old duke's senses have not dulled, and once in the boughs of his tambuerti tree, he cast disdainful glances at the groaning and deeply frustrated hounds. So that was just a very sort of, uh, I think, almost nonchalant approach to the whole experience by Tingana. He's such a wily old fellow. He heard those things coming from a long way off. He judged the distance between himself, the tree, and the dogs to perfection, just trotted up into the bars of the tree, knew they couldn't get there, put his head down. He didn't growl at them once, he didn't hiss at them once. He just kind of lay there and glared at them while they hopped up and down below the tree in a state of deep anguish. It was very funny, and I don't know if you could hear them making the noise in that clip, but they made the most amusing sort of angry, irritated, howling bark. And Tingana cared not one jot at all. So that was very special. Now, finally, Ralph Kirsten, who is in his first safari lives for the last little while, has uh, developed some signal, and he'd like to say hello. Well, thank you, James, and hello, everybody, and welcome here to the Juma, uh, excuse me, the Chitwa waterhole, just in front of Chitwa Chitwa uh, Lodge, and you can see, actually, just from those hippos there, they're all sitting out of the water because it's rather cold, and, um, well, they've all escaped out of that cold onto the bank, trying to get themselves a little bit warmer, and, um, well, they're all being rather noisy, um, some of them are all sitting with those um, uh, those ox peckers. We can actually hear them quite nicely now. And every now and then they all fly up and make a lot of chattering noise. And we can hear the hippos here once again. And you can see actually by um, the poo that is on those hippos that they've been out of the water uh, for a large period of the day already. And that just shows that this cold front that has moved in uh, has made it rather uncomfortable for them in the water. But at least we get to see those hippos all out of the water and thank you all the viewers for saying welcome back it has been a wonderful vacation that I had down in the Eastern Cape where I am from but I'm really enjoying being back this morning was my first little walk and uh, now being here on Chitta and really uh, loving to be in the presence of these big animals once more so but uh, well, it seems like the weather has followed me because it came up from Cape Town and it hit us in the Eastern Cape and then come all the way up with us here. Now, 
Oh, Laura Moore, you say that's quite a cuddle of hippos. Well, I would definitely not be very comfortable going and cuddling one of them, but they do look very cuddly, don't they? And look at that little youngster being a little bit naughty, I'm sure, as youngsters are. I've got two little boys of my own, and I know that they're always looking uh, or up to nonsense, but it's always good fun. And look at that little baby. He's... he's um. He's grown quite a bit, actually. Now, Oren, um, the cold does bother the hippos a little bit. As you can see here, it does drive them to, to move uh, accordingly. Now, that's half the reason why they, they do go into the water, um, because they're not very good at uh, regulating their own temperature. Uh, they, they sort of uh, need the water for that thermoregulation, and it's normally too hot for them out of the water uh, in the hot sun. But when it's cold like this, obviously the water is also very cold and so they then come out of the water to to get a bit of warmth I would say because normally they only exit the water to go out and feed and they spend most of the day in the water frolicking and and snoozing actually because they're pretty much nocturnal when it's very hot and they come out at night to graze and well it looks like these two are, are braving the cold and I know all about cold because I do a lot of surfing myself, and I, I, but I do do it with a wetsuit on. I'm not uh, privileged enough to live near warm waters like these guys at the moment. I'm sure they would, they would quite like to have a wetsuit or a neoprene bodysuit because that would really help them in this kind of weather. And so it's wonderful to sit here in the presence of these big animals, as I've said, and it seems like it's been an absolutely amazing week um, with all the big cats, but, uh, well, it's not just been an amazing week, it's an amazing day. It is an amazing day, uh, but for the light, which has failed us now completely. When we arrived here, she was bathed in perfection. Now... It's really got a little grim above her. Still, we're sitting with the leopardess. How could we complain? Well, we simply could not. And it's a leopardess that we do not see very often at all. She is most often south and often east of us. So it's very, very pleasant to have her here with us. It would be very nice if her little male cub was in the same place. But we won't be fussy especially after what we saw this morning. So if you are a new viewer, let's just quickly unpack the little hierarchy, or not hierarchy, the family tree of leopards that we have been showing you in those clips. Basically, we have got Tundi, who is the new queen of Juma, a nigh-on 13-year-old leopardess, uh, coming to the sort of twilight of her years, if you like. She's got a cub called Tlalamba, who's now eight months old. This is her daughter, Guchaba, who, if I'm not mistaken, is about... Guchaba is not much more than four, I don't think. I keep forgetting the ages of these animals. And Guchaba has a young cub as well. And that little cub, we think, is probably about six months old at this stage. I think she was born, yeah, about six months old. He's a, that's a male. So that's the females of our particular patch. Then we have Tingana, the aging Duke of Juma. He is now uh, 13 years old as well, and he looks after the territory that they two reside in. He's been pushed to the limits of late by a chap called Hukumori, an intimidating, short but very stocky leopard who's come in from we don't know where. He's been spotted all over parts of the southern Kruger on his way up to setting a territory now to the west of where Tingana calls himself at home. Into his territory has come another female uh, after the demise of Tandi's sister Shadow. Her name is Shidulu, which is a tremendously wonderfully romantic name. It means termite mound. She's also a very uh, appealing looking leopard. And if you were to see them together, this leopard and Shadulu, you would immediately notice the difference. This is again, of course, if you are a new viewer, most of our regular viewers can spot these leopards and identify them from about ooh, possibly one spot. And Shadulu muscling in on the western side of Tundi's territory. So those are the main leopard characters that we are looking at at the moment. 
and there is a little bit of conflict I suppose but things are settling down quite nicely now but from time to time as happened this morning so the conflict will brew up again and attract the attentions of a whole lot of other predators all right Lee, let's go back and have a look now at what Tingana got up to the morning after his impala for two mornings after his impala foray two days after the great impala investigation the same two female dogs made another large kill that they were unable to finish Satiated, they left the carcass of the adult bushbuck ram and disappeared. There was much debate over which scavenger would grab the windfall, and that afternoon, the Duke, who had followed the scent of the carcass for more than a kilometer, gave us our answer. Bizarrely, and with a large audience waiting next to the now disemboweled bushbuck, Tingana lost the scent and lay down in the grass. I even tried to point it out to him, but he paid no heed. Now, I'm not sure if you could see what I was trying to do there but the reason the aerial was in the shot and we had all those poles and things was because we were parked in front of that carcass waiting for him to walk up to it because up until about 10 meters before he got there he was on a beeline straight for it and suddenly he turned to the left and there were three vehicles waiting for him to snatch up the carcass and drag it into a tree uh, but unfortunately he lost the wind somehow so I was trying desperately to point it out to him but he paid no heed and eventually after 20 minutes or so we had to leave him eventually however he did find it eventually Tingana must have found the bushbuck and dragged it into a picturesque bush willow tree overlooking a dry riverbed the scraggly and spiky branches were clearly not particularly comfortable and he had to try endless positions before settling in for a snooze. With a ready-made meal to last him the rest of the day, the old Duke was satisfied with a week's work well done. So that was his experience with the bushbuck kill and very nice that he managed to find it and he then fed on that kill for two and a half days it really is quite impressive that he managed to eke out uh, sort of not a living but he eked out meals from that half-eaten bushbuck for that length of time the hyenas came in they spent a lot of time waiting for him here we go they put coming tundies in tundies in my goodness gracious me that's the mother, that's Tandy. This is unbelievable stuff, everybody. Let's see if she goes up. She's marking her territory now. I don't think she's going to try and go up that tree. But she might. Let's just wait and see what happens here. This is unbelievable stuff. We've wondered where she was. We've said she was possibly off towards the west. But here she is now. So they're right on a territorial boundary, as I say. And of course, they won't tolerate each other, like I say. But I don't think it will be nearly as violent as it might be were they not related. We certainly saw Tandy or Shadow and Karula who were mother and daughter interacting a few times together on their territorial boundary. They used to blow spit bubbles at each other, which was quite funny. This magic dragon was it absolutely here we go again with action. And all she's doing now is marking her territory, making sure, making very sure that Shidulu, not Shidulu, that Kuchava knows who's boss. There's a lot of hissing and growling going on here. What we don't want to do also is get caught up in some kind of what they call not misplaced aggression, what's it called? Deferred aggression, I'm using the wrong word. So if things do get really quite heavy with Tandi, who is known not to like her, vehicles too much we might just back off slightly <laughs> no no 
Nadine Tandy, in my opinion, is the least funny leopard in all of the Sabi Sands. She is no comedian at all. I don't wish to have her this close to me. Sit nice and still, Sebastian. We're just going to sit very quietly here. Well, I don't know if Tandy knows that's her daughter. I'm 90% sure she does. But she's seen as a rival now. She's not seen as a daughter. Sit nice and slow. She's in front of us. There she is. All of this is marking territory. She's got an angry face. She always has had. Not a friendly kitty. That was quite exciting. Now, I've known leopards in my time who I would never react like that around. They, you know, you can walk close by, you can see them on foot, they don't mind at all. This cat is not friendly, and as Tristan describes her, he says, she's an angry cat. And he wasn't in the least bit surprised when he saw her initiating the aggression this morning. Now, unfortunately, we might have to leave the sighting at some stage because, unfortunately, there are lots of people trying to get into the sighting. Safari Heart, those ears tipped down mean precisely what they would in a house cat. They mean, I'm not happy, I'm going to scratch and bite anything that makes me cross. Now, she'll probably mark territory all the way around Guchava's tree. Guchava doesn't look particularly panicked by the whole affair. And then I suspect what she'll do is she might come charging back in there because she came running up. I don't believe that Tandy didn't know Guchava was here. I mean, she's sitting in the most obvious tree for miles. But maybe she just woke up, stepped out of a drainage line and saw her up here and then thought, well, oh, I'll show her. And it's that kind of noise that would have brought the lions in and that kind of noise that would have brought Tingana in. I'm just going to get on the radio quickly. I just have to find out how many people are trying to get here. How many stations on standby for the sighting of Guchava? Because I fear me we are going to have to vacate. Any stations on standby for the sighting of Guchava? But if no one answers their radios because they're not listening, then it's really not my fault. Sorry, Orb, say that again, please. Sorry about this, everybody. Just enjoy the leopard. Andrew, what's your position? don't have to move just yet he's in a while okay thanks Andrew I'll move out as soon as you get you he's still away away so we don't have to leave just yet that's great news again if you are a new viewer this is a game drive radio so there are lots and lots of people around here and so we just need to be very sensitive to their needs and I'm using a radio to talk to all these people um, Sorry, Julie, I'm going to have to ask you a question again. The radio is in me ear. 
Yeah, I think the chances, Julia, are absolutely that she could be more aggressive to non-related females. Shadulu, for example, who is an unrelated female, I think would uh, cop probably slightly more of a warning and maybe even more of a beating uh, than poor old Guchava got meted out or that she meted out to Guchava today. That said, I mean, you know, for Tandi to have made the physical contact that she did is not common for leopards. And bite on another leopard, it would be difficult to see how it could have been that much more aggressive. Phew! Great excitement here in the Sabi Sant. Righty, we're going to take a moment to have a bit of a breather and let's go just down the road. Well, that's amazing. There's still a lot of activity around here. Not with the lions, unfortunately. They have not moved. I have heard one or two snores coming from the lions. Um, for a second, I thought Tristan was nearby. Um, <laughs> but the, the lions are just still resting. Um, I, I don't know how far they, they moved during the course of the night um, and early this morning. But, um, but yeah, they are not interested in moving at this stage. But I still think because it is cooler, there is a possibility that they may get up and start moving around. So I'm going to be very, very patient and sit with these resting lions. Um, but it's... A, I mean, it's unbelievable to think that maybe 200 meters to the east of where I am now are those two leopards busy, um, busy having a bit of a standoff. I mean, that is amazing, Kuchaba and Tandi, literally 200 meters. Yeah, so KD, I think that links up to your question. It, yeah, about 200 meters or so, I think, with in in that vicinity. Um, so not far. And if they, if those leopards start growling and making a noise, then um, and then potentially these lions may they they may just be alerted and and possibly move and investigate and see what what is going on there and what the commotion is about at this stage we haven't heard anything i can hear the vehicles uh, moving now and then with those leopards but i haven't heard a leopard sound or growl or anything like that so and these lions certainly have not heard anything but if they do hear it then possibly maybe they they may get up and go and investigate It's amazing how still they are. We were very fortunate actually to find them initially because now with them lying so flat we wouldn't have seen them in the long grass but we saw that leg up in the air and that, and that large paw which just stood out for us to be able to spot, spot the lions lying in the grass. Alright, so I'm as I said, I'm going to stay with these these uh, lions, even though they are resting. But let's go find out if there's any further activity with the leopards. No more activity. Seb did have a brief view of Tandi, just a little bit further east of where we are now. So basically to the front of the car where she walked off. And then she came and peered around a bush malevolently and then lay down, but she's in the long grass, and I said to Seb, you wouldn't like to go for a walk around there now, would you? He said, no, not very much. You can see she is completely relaxed, and Seb said this could easily have been going on for hours. You know, she could have been running in and out of the sighting, Tundi that is, and shouting at Kuchava for hours. As Byron says, the lions are 200 meters away, which means I suspect Tundi's probably been looking at Kuchava for a long time. Tingana has probably decided that hell hath no fury like the proverbial scorned leopardess, and so he's probably very wisely keeping a distance 
from lions and squabbling leopardesses. If I were him, I'd be as far away from here as possible. Peter, I don't know necessarily if a cub makes a leopard more aggressive. Certainly if she feels the cub is under threat, then yes, absolutely. But, you know, would she feel that her cub was under threat from Guchava? Yeah, possibly. So possibly that is, if, if Tandi didn't have a young cub in the area, perhaps she would react with slightly less irritation. She certainly wouldn't be particularly friendly about it, though. But it is possible that she would be slightly less aggressive. See the claws just sheathed over there. We don't actually have to leave just yet because Aubrey's decided he's going to leave. So we can stay here for a little bit longer. See if we can see where Tandy's gone. But it would be very interested, of course, to get the leopard expert's testimony on what's happening here. Well, James, it seems as though it's just complete chaos and something that we'll just have to wait and see exactly what happens. Now, you might be wondering what is going on, but because I was trying to prove a point that here it is not very easy to find these leopards in the grass, particularly leopards the size of Tlalamba. If they lie down, it becomes very, very, very difficult to find them. It's also the same situation up in Kenya, and one person who's had to deal with that a lot is Scotty Dyson. Well, everyone, I'm sure a lot of you are very, very happy to see this cheetah. It's Kikenya, and she's got lucky. She's busy snacking on something. We'll tell you a little bit about that later. But more importantly, we also got lucky, and yesterday we stumbled upon her about 20 kilometers away from where she was last seen about eight days ago. We stumbled upon this cheetah very close to the Tanzanian border, and I initially wasn't sure who it was. I was really hoping it would be Kikenya. The last time she was seen, only one of her five cubs appeared to still be alive. Once in position, we could tell for certain that it was her. And once that was established, we took a closer look at her nipples to see if there was any sign of cubs still nursing. Sadly, it wasn't the case, confirming to us that she has in fact lost all of them. Now, as exciting as, as it is that we found her, it's obviously very sad that it seems like she's lost all five of her cubs. Anyway, it's one of those things in nature, and at least she's got lucky. She's got herself this meal, and after knowing where she was yesterday in the evening, we came back here first thing in the morning and got to witness this. We got off to an easy start finding her perched up on a termite mound, surveying the plains for food. It didn't take her long, and she descended with intent. She used the long grass as cover and slowly crept forward before launching her attack. The Tommy tried its best to avoid her, dodging and weaving, but she was simply too fast. And after a short wrestle, had subdued her victim. Then, she wisely made sure no other predators had seen the hunt, ensuring both her and her meal were safe. Once content no threats were nearby, she dragged the killer short distance before settling in for her feast. Well, that poor Tommy had absolutely no idea Kikenya was coming and a great example of how stealthy a cheetah can be when the grass is long. They don't always have to do very long chases at high speeds. I'm mean, very happy that she has managed to keep this kill to herself because she hasn't managed to drag it under a bush and I was concerned that vultures were going to give away her position to some hyena that would steal this kill from her. But so far she's been lucky 
and let's just hope that the next few hours she continues to snack on this. We certainly aren't going anywhere in case any sneaky hyenas start to prowl about, and we don't want to miss a thing. Now, it's very sad to think that Kikenia has unfortunately lost her little ones. It's, I was there trying to find them for the eight days that she was missing, and we drove up and down and round and round and round, and I think in the one day I did even close to 200 kilometers just around that sort of area, trying to kind of find her and spend time trying to see her. And the unfortunate problem was that she just had so many predators around there, the one day we went, well, two, in two days that we went there, we found three different prides all on her den sites and around her den sites. So she had a real struggle with that. I know there was a leopard that even went into her den sites a few weeks ago. And so, you know, it's, for a cheetah in the Mara Triangle particularly, it is incredibly difficult. She's got very few places to hide. She's got long grass in the particular area that she was in, which meant that there was not very many prey animals, so she had to go very far for food and come back again, which meant she left those cubs exposed. And even if she was there and lions arrived, she's just not equipped to defend herself and her cubs from lions. She's quite quick. Careful, Jandra, you're going to go into a tree. She's quite quick and she can run away, obviously, but the cubs are still helpless and defenseless at such a young age. And so if they get discovered in the den like that, the chances are, unfortunately, that they are not going to be able to survive, which is a very, very big shame. But hopefully, you know, she'll bounce back and she'll be able to find somewhere to, to den that's you know, after the migration, when things get a little bit shorter, the grass gets a bit shorter, and maybe a little bit more food. That's all around. It's been a drama-filled week, that's for sure. And today is just kind of the capping on top. And you know, we we're kind of talking about all these things that have been happening. And you know, today is a sort of epitome of how difficult it can be for our cats. Now, Eloise, Kikenya means early morning. And then in Swahili, or Ma actually, which is the local language in the Mara Triangle. And so that's what it means. And how she got that name, I'm not 100% sure, to be honest with you. We'll have to maybe try and ask the cheetah man of Africa, Scotty Dyson himself, and see what he thinks about it at some point. So I'll try and get hold of him and see what, if there was a reason that she got named it. Anyway, we're going to carry on. We're going to try and start actually having to head out of this area because it's getting dark quite quickly now. And so while we kind of pace ourselves and try and start getting a bit closer to home, let's send you back across to Ralph, who I think is still on Chitwa. And I wonder if maybe somebody else is lurking on that side of the, our area. Well, it's still a very, very beautiful scene unfolding here at uh, Chitwa Waterhole. A couple of the um, Egyptian geese making a bit of a racket. But... Um, well, the hippos are still doing what they do best, most of them sleeping, a little bit of movement, especially from the little youngsters who may be getting a little bit hungry. And there you can see just in between them, there's a couple of the blacksmith lapwings and the uh, three banded plovers here just on the water's edge. There's also the odd wagtail. Oh, that's a nice big mouth opening there on that youngster as well. So I'm sure they're going to be getting a little bit irritated with all the adults that are just snoozing away, as the youngsters do. And they want them to get up and go moving and go feeding, I would imagine. Now, Tony, um, I'm not quite sure if I've seen um, or any of the guides have actually seen any of these crocodiles catching uh, any fish or any of the prey here next to the banks. There's, I know that there's at least two big crocodiles here. I'm not seeing them today. We did see a monitor lizard a little bit earlier, but um, he disappeared down into a little burrow, and it's not the best of days to see reptiles because um, it's rather chilly, um, uh, relatively speaking, for us out here. Um, as I say, the, the reptiles, they don't really enjoy this cold weather being ectothermic. Um, but I'm not quite sure. I don't know if James or Tristan or anybody else has seen him uh, eating any of that. Now, uh, well, there's a little bit of action here with these baby hippos, but it seems like there's a whole lot more action happening just on over on Juma. Well, not right now, but yes, a whole lot more action is happening or has happened on Juma. I have seen those crocodiles eating. We saw them eating the skin, we think, 
of a nyala or a bushbuck at one stage. What happened to the rest of the animal, I think, is pretty self-explanatory from the uh, sort of last bits of skin that there were in the water. So those crocodiles definitely do catch the odd thing that comes down to drink. I think mainly they're eating fish, though. Piscivorous crocodiles. Guchava not phased by the incursions of her mother. Her very angry mother, foul mood that she's in, has disappeared. We haven't seen her again. We haven't tried to go and look at her, look for her. I want to wait and see what happens over here. Ali, um, yes, we have named Guchava's male cub. His name is Dennis. It's a beautiful leopard name and uh, we'll be using it from today. I meant to make that announcement earlier that Grachava's cub's name is Dennis. <laughs> the internet has now exploded. No, don't worry everybody, we have not called the cub anything. He does not have a name yet. We don't see him regularly enough. If we saw him again, if we spent more time with him, definitely we would name him. But at this stage, no, we have not named him. We've only seen him once. Or at one kill, I think. We may have seen him once more as a little fellow. But we haven't seen him since the kill that we had on Torchwood. Ooh, when was that? Probably about six weeks ago now, I think. He's probably got quite a lot bigger. So, Dennis, who we will not call Dennis, has not been seen for some time. But I do ask that if... And when we name him, uh, I ask very profoundly that we don't choose a name as gormless as Shidulu, the termite mound, or Hukumuri, the chicken medicine. Both of those two names are the two most ridiculous leopard names I've ever heard in my life. Why you'd call the most beautiful cat in Africa termite mound and chicken medicine is quite beyond me. Now, Byron, of course, loves naming animals. It's his very favourite thing in all the world. He loves giving names, not only names, but also titles to animals, and he's going to do that now for you with the evokers. <sighs> James. Um, yes, well, we've got um, Phil, Will, and Thomas over here, the three evoker males, Phil, Will, and Thomas. Um, <laughs> no, James. James knows I do not enjoy the naming animals. Well, you know, for the purpose of, again, as I said, for the purpose of the show, it's fantastic. It's great to have these characters and get to get to follow them and understand their movements. I just think there's uh, there's a fine line that that we need to be careful of anyway but um, I'm so glad that there's been so much leopard activity the last few days and also the lions we've um, luckily these males have come through but we have had some other lions around um, a few days ago we had um, we actually had another pride come through uh, surprisingly out of nowhere which was which was really really interesting A few days ago, we were treated with another lion sighting. At first, we were unsure of which pride it was. After close inspection, we could make out five females and two young males. This was the Talamati pride. The lions appeared to be hungry and were clearly on the hunt. Fortunately, they had no luck, but instead chose to enjoy the morning sunlight and warm up for the day. <laughs> All right, so that was the Talamati Pride that you just saw. That did arrive on Juma the other day, and they passed through quite briefly. Um, well, they spent the day here, which was nice. So we got to find them very early in the morning and follow them. And again, it was a nice, cool morning, actually quite cold. So they were very active during the morning, moving around. They were, they well, they 
clearly were hungry. They were looking for food. They saw a number of different antelope um, in the drainage lines and tried to stalk, but just unfortunately didn't have any luck. They did chase some um, impala and one or two in Yala at one stage. Um, but they they weren't very very lucky in the morning and they did end up settling down however we caught up with them again in the afternoon it was an overcast and cool start to the sunset safari we managed to find the Talamati pride in the same area we left them that morning they were very affectionate towards each other and soon began to get active and move Scanning the dense drainage line, they were clearly on the hunt again. Unfortunately, they were too exposed in the clearings, and the ever alert impala moved off very swiftly. And there you could see we did um, fortunately find them again that, that afternoon and spent some time with them. Again, moving through the drainage lines, the thicker areas, trying to look for some potential food, uh, but then went out onto the clearings. And that just was almost impossible. It's too open. It was still light. All the impala could see them. And as you could see from that little clip, the impala alarm called. They followed the lions. They actually um, moved towards them at one stage just so they could keep an eye on them. And as one or two of the younger lionesses ran after them, the impala just took off. So the lions had no chance of hunting. But I do believe um, later that evening they did cross out of Juma. I mean, they walked right past camp, which was amazing. But they crossed out of Juma onto Bifelzook, and they did get something to eat that evening. I'm not sure what it was. I think it was a um, a small kill, possibly an impala, uh, but but I'm not, not too sure. But they did apparently get something that evening, later that evening, much later. So, But wonderful to see the Talamati pride come through, the five uh, lionesses and the two young males. Um, so, you know... I've been uh, been quite uh, fortunate this last week seeing two different groups of lions that I have not seen before. The Talamati pride and then the evokers who are still resting. Now, I wonder if the other dark-maned male of Juma um, is having a good afternoon. Let's go find out. Well, I'm having a wonderful afternoon. Eh? Thoroughly enjoying being on foot again, it's the one thing that I really missed was actually being on foot and walking in the bush. It's good for the soul. And in the Mara, you can't do it. So really, really nice to kind of be out and exploring again and sort of looking at tracks and all these kind of things. It's been a bit of a tough one in terms of we didn't see too many tracks. And it was kind of round and round in circles and didn't find too much. But you never know. We'll sort of gave it a badge and we're on our way home and you never know if maybe something pops out in front of us so we'll just keep going and trying to see what there is. Jean-Dre, are you okay there? Jean-Dre... <laughs> so Jean-Dre has managed to plant himself firmly inside of a tree which took a bit of dancing. It was a very good two-step you did there. Fred Astaire would be very, very impressed. In fact, I wonder if you've been taking lessons from Byron, because Byron loves a little dance, and this afternoon he was dancing, wasn't he, Jandre? He was all over the place doing his little two steps and singing. In fact, maybe he would like to sing forward of you, because he was very vocal this afternoon when we left camp. Byron was good enough to give us a lift slightly closer to where the tracks were. Anyway, we need <laughs> to kind of keep going through this thicket, but while we do that, and obviously we're still looking out for tracks, and it's getting a little bit darker, and so the nocturnal animals are going to be starting to kind of come out, and that was, was helping in the Mara to find some of the animals that were moving at night when the rains had fallen. We're in the area searching for the sausage tree pride, and believe it or not, those scrapes in the mud are actually really clear clues as to where they might be. Uh, yesterday evening, Scott was here with the sausage tree pride until a massive thunderstorm sent him scurrying back to camp. Uh, we've returned to see what they got up to, and it looks as though they've been very busy during the course of the night. So we have the tracks of them slipping in the mud, but it's not just that. There's some other tracks as well, so we can clearly see if we have a look that there are lion tracks that are not skidded or obscured. 
There they are over there. We can just see them as the mud starts to dry. But what's more interesting, and the reason for them slipping and sliding all over the place, is off to the left a little bit over there. Now, those are the tracks of a massive buffalo bull. And he clearly was in the wrong place at the wrong time as the sausage tree pride took advantage of the chaos of the storm to hunt him down and try and catch him. Now, the question is, where do these tracks lead? And will we find the sausages on a fresh buffalo kill? Back we find ourselves over here, not having to work nearly as hard as Jamie Patterson there in the Maasai Mara. We've had to work, in fact, pretty unhard this morning. Can one work unhard? Haven't had to work very hard. Easy day at the office. Which, of course, was hard. Should be on a Sunday afternoon. Now, we've had no update on where Guchava's cub is. In fact, I haven't heard of a sighting of the little male for some time, but she does spend a lot of time on the reserve to the east of us, where they don't do much walking, and certainly, in fact, it's, until this weekend, it's been pretty sort of bereft of much vehicle activity. So, you know, quite possibly stashed away very safely in a drainage line over there. My goodness, it's not only cats out here tonight. Now this is an absolutely beautiful scene. We've got the sun going down there with a lot of clouds around making for beautiful colours and a lovely young bull elephant just standing in front for us. Now, I think that elephants, for me, uh, are one of the most amazing animals, um, one of the large animals, I must say, because, uh, and I've, I've actually spent probably uh, the most time with, with elephants out of all the big game, um, you know, out of my years of following them in the Namib Desert, and so I do really enjoy being back uh, here in their presence. And this being the first for me since I've been away, uh, lovely to watch this young bull. Seems he was just feeding on a red bush willow, which is uh, no mean feat because it's very, very hard wood indeed. And so I wouldn't like to be chewing on that. It would definitely break my teeth uh, very quickly. So luckily that he's uh, very well adapted to grinding down hard wood like the Combretum apiculatum. Right, look at him, he's very relaxed and as I always say, probably the best elephant to watch is a, a bull elephant that's not in must. Only very happy-go-lucky, relaxed and uh, also quite in cu curious and inquisitive, very often uh, approaching you on foot, but not in any menacing way, only just to come and see what you're all about. He's putting his ears out there a little bit. That's definitely not to cool himself down. Wafting his tail around. There's not many flies around either. And that's just probably in normal habit. They would be wafting the, the tail to keep the flies away and wafting the ears to keep themselves cool. But, uh, well, the temperature is cool today and there's no flies around. So uh, he's just probably doing it from force of habit. And putting the ears out would then also just be to be uh, making himself look quite big. And, well, it looks like, look at those eyes. It almost looks like he's a little bit sleepy, doesn't it? And, well, he's not the only sleepy animal out here. It's been a very busy week, everyone. I do apologise. I'm also sleepy. Let's go back to the leopard. <laughs> you see, uh, that's me pretending to be a play actor. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I was a play actor, everybody. And I'm sorry that you all have to sort of live that dream vicariously with me. 
Well, not vicariously. You have to witness it. No progression of any movement here. We might take a little turn around and see if we can't find Tundi after this. While we do that, let us go and take a look at what a male leopard does after he's eaten himself into a balloon. After a week of scavenging off his mortal enemies, the wild dogs, Tingana, his belly fit to bursting, returned to southern Juma on patrol. His absence while feeding has been prolonged, and he must therefore re-establish his presence lest some interloper arrive and assume the dukedom is in need of another duke. Astoundingly, for a leopard this age, his condition seems to be improving rather than declining, and I'm not sure he's ever looked heavier. His sawing echoed well into the darkness, and in fact woke us all up in camp before dawn this morning. I'm just talking to Seb everybody we have found Tundi again there she is and that little vicious tail tip of hers started to go <laughs> as we got close so I stopped and now we're looking at her angly spotty face through the thorn bushes which are about as prickly as her personality staring straight at the back end of her daughter. Well, much as it must pain him, with us sitting here, with our two leopards, Tristan has managed to find, well, something fairly common, really. Well, this is about as common as it gets, James, and, you know, when you're scratching around trying to find something, at least it's better than nothing. But it's still nice to be on foot and just see, you know, impalas all around you. There's actually a nyala that's going to come out fairly shortly for us and kind of just expose itself on the sort of crossing the road now there, genre. So it's going to go across. There's also a beautiful sort of patch of sky that's just lit up with the sunset so we're trying to kind of head closer to home because it is starting to get very very dark and these nyala and impalas are actually very relaxed they haven't moved very much at all they've allowed us to get very close and you know obviously if we were a predator like something like a leopard or, or lions they would have been shouting a long time ago and so it just goes to show that they've learned that some people walking around here are no longer a threat to them you, it would be interesting a few years ago when you know hunting was probably in this area a lot more than it is now whether or not these guys would have had a situation where they would have sort of alarm called and ran it or if they would have just sat still like they are doing right now because they're really fully aware that we are here at the moment right so we're going to try and walk past them and try and kind of get out of here and get a little bit closer to home before it gets far too dark it's a situation where we've got you know the light fading very very quickly so we're gonna have to do a little bit of a hustle to get there but we were talking a little bit earlier at sort of tracking and, and the rewards that tracking can, can bring about and how important it is to be able to recognize tracks. And Jamie found out just how important it is to be able to see them and follow up on them. We found them, we found them, we tracked them down and we found them and by the looks of their head down, yep, there you go, you can just see the tip of a buffalo horn. We were right in our interpretation of the signs in the mud. The sausage tree pride, I hope, have caught themselves a buffalo. Let's go and find out if it's them. And importantly, let's go and find out who's there. The question remains. They've been very, very split up over the last few days with the young males here and the females there. And we still haven't seen any sign of the tiny little cub that we introduced you to not so long ago. So I'm really keeping my fingers crossed that it's here. I can see the young male, one of the young males, the youngest of them. Uh, no rocks, no rocks. This is the trick when you drive in, is to avoid giant boulders in the grass. Here we go, I can see Kinky Tail. Don't worry, we'll be there in one second. We'll have a chance to see who's here. For now, I can only see two. But it's definitely the sausages. Hi guys, well done. Oh, this is such a fresh kill. Hello, my boy. 
Well done. Did you catch yourself breakfast? Ah, and Kinky Tails decided she didn't want to be on camera. And now he's going to... Oh, no, he's not. I was going to say, surely he's not going to abandon that kill that quickly. Well, from the tracks, the whole pride was here. Well, hopefully they're just taking a break, maybe having a drink after their hard work of bringing down what looks like a massive buffalo bull. And we're going to stake out here, sit and wait and see for one of two things, whether or not the happy zebra clan decides to challenge the sausages, but more importantly, whether or not that little cocktail sausage is brought for his first meal. Uh, now we've had a little bit of movement from one of the males starting to clean himself. He did stand up, stretch, and just change positions. But who knows? Possibly we may get some movement out of all three of them. Now there has been a lot of lion activity on Safari Live, especially the prides up in the Mara. Um, and I know we just showed you the clip of the sausage tree pride, but there, there was another clip that we wanted to show you of one of the females. Um, seems to be a bit injured, but she at least had something to eat. The sausage tree pride did indeed manage to keep the hyenas away from their buffalo carcass. And two days later, they've moved off, leaving it to the vultures because they are so incredibly full. They were full before they caught the buffalo. They are now fit to burst. They have eaten so much. And they've chosen to lie underneath the most impenetrable thicket that they could possibly have chosen that's surrounded by massive boulders. Now, unfortunately, this is the best view that we can possibly get. The good news is that all eight of the lions were at the kill a couple of days ago, so I suspect they will all be here still. But one of them, the missing lioness, was not in the best of conditions. The massive buffalo kill served as a reunion for the sausage tree pride and we rejoiced when we saw the missing lioness who must have been hiding somewhere and licking her wounds. Painful punctures on her paw and nasty scratches across her face tell a truly distressing story. But the discomfort did not stop her from gorging herself. She even managed to brave a relatively short run on three legs. Appetite sated, she returned to the comfort of the shade and her pride. Although that lioness is limping really badly and she looks as though she has some nasty puncture wounds on her paw, possibly from a bite mark, she does have a full belly and of course she has Kinky Tail, who is here, along with the rest of the pride to help to keep her well fed. And lions are resilient. All animals out here are resilient. I think she's going to be absolutely fine. Unfortunately, I'm afraid that the same cannot be said for the little cub that we saw a few weeks ago. We've confirmed that the female that's mating now and the female that was mating earlier with Brent is in fact the mother of that small cub, which is not a good sign at all. I think it's safe to say that the harshness of the Mara, the fact that that lioness is a first-time mother and the fact that that cub was all on its own, I don't think it managed to survive. Unfortunate, but as you can see, the sausage tree pride are already busy creating the next generation of little sausages. Well, that is an, another interesting clip, and also one, uh, it is fascinating actually to see um, with a lion that gets injured, as long as that lion is able to keep up with the pride, it will still feed. And I'm hoping and almost certain that that lion will recover from the injury and potentially be fine again. Now, it shows you just how nature works. Within a pride, lions, if they do fight or injure themselves, as long as the other the members of the pride are still hunting and that lion gets food, I've seen it before. Lions will recover very soon after quite a nasty injury. So that is really wonderful. Uh, and interesting to see with the sausage tree pride. Now, I have not seen them yet. Maybe one day. Who knows?
KB, these evokers, um, they'll probably only get their full manes at about five or six years old. Now, I'm not entirely sure of their age, but I think, judging by their size, they're probably around three or four years old, maybe a bit older than that, between four and five years old, I think. But yeah, the full manes, usually around five, six years old, those manes really start filling out. Um, and then by seven, it's most likely a full mane. So, KB. So, KB, I think, yeah, that's generally the, um, the age that they get those full manes. I think, uh, Kirsty, if it's all right, we're going to try to switch to infrared now. We're starting to lose quite a bit of light. All right, so let's have a look and see. There we go. And uh, still a little bit of movement. There has been one or two yawns, but just changing positions. And um, nothing too exciting just yet. Hopefully our patience pays off. All right, let's head back to James and find out how that leopard's doing. It could easily pay off, you know. They're not far from here. Nighttime is falling. They might come down here just to have a look, see what's going on. Now, I think this is a rather beautiful black and white image we're looking at there. It is, of course, shot in infrared. That is why it is black and white. And so we have arrived at the artistic piece of the show where Sebastian Rombi gets to, well, play with his artistic Gallic side. As he said to me as we drove around here, he said, please excuse the accent here, Sebastian. This is Africa. <laughs> it is wonderful Africa. Yes, Guy, sorry, I was just waiting for your question. Well, Sky, if I was Guchava, and obviously I'm not, I think I would climb down the tree and slink away. But she might be reticent to do that because she knows Tundi will chase her. And she's definitely watching Tundi. I just need to quickly get on the radio for one second. No affirmative, go ahead. But she looks pretty relaxed now. In fact, her face is up, Seb. You can grab some more artistic shots of her beautiful face. Now, I know this is going to cause consternation amongst the leopard fans of the interweb, but I think that Guchava is much prettier than her mummy. What do you think, Seb? I agree. You agree, good. Okay, so it'll be two of us who will be strung up at dawn. I think that is a spectacular looking leopard. Takes after a daddy, I fear me. Okay. All right, for the first time ever, Ralph Kirsten, with his highly excitable nature, is playing with the thermal camera. Let's go and find out what he thinks about that. Well, we're firstly having a look through our infrared there, and you can see a little bit of an obscured view of this young bull elephant that we were watching a bit earlier. And he's still stationary, feeding nicely. But what is extremely interesting is going to be when we have a look on the infrared uh, fleur, which is the thermal camera. So now we can see that that is all down to the temperature that the animal is exhibiting, the blue being the lighter temperature, and the higher the temperature, the redder the color. Now, what is extremely interesting for me is, look at those ears. They are almost, uh, you know, they're, they're, the, they're the coolest part of the body. And right down at the tip of the trunk seems to be the hottest part. But it is incredibly interesting to see all the little hot points on the skin of this elephant and how we can see him now through the branches of the obscured view that we have just with the naked eye. But wow, that is, it's amazing for me to see this kind of image. And what is even more amazing is how cool those ear flaps 
are. And that just indicates how the elephants actually use their ears as a real radiator and um, cooling all that blood that's going through there. And that then obviously leaves the ears heading towards the brain. And when it is very hot out here in Africa, that is an absolutely perfect radiator. Now, Tweety Kid, you say that that would make an awesome uh, T-shirt. That would definitely, I, I think it's amazing. And elephants, as I say, one of, if not my favorite animal. Um, well, definitely the animal that I have the biggest affinity with because of the time I've spent with them. But this is a different angle altogether and one that I have never, ever seen before. And look at how he's just using his trunk. He's still feeding on a lot of um, wooden or, you know, barky pieces and branches, which they tend to do in winter. And so it is absolutely fascinating. And thanks for joining me with this fascinating picture. And, well, as per usual, I'm not the only one with something fascinating. James, uh, over to you. I told you he'd be deeply excited by all of that technology. Well, there he is. Now, we don't have a huge amount of time left, but we still have lots of highlights from the Mara to show you, so let us move from rosettes to spots. So, everyone, the good news is, is that Kikenya did, in fact, manage to finish off that Thompson's gazelle kill without being pestered by any hyenas. And... We left her full-bellied in the evening. Since then, however, we've spent the last four days searching, and we haven't had any luck. Now, it's a tricky area to work for a number of reasons. The grass is very, very long, and another major point is that not too many other vehicles come down into this corner of the Mara Triangle. Let me actually show you on a map. We are tucked away in the southwestern corner of the Triangle, and... There's not too much going on down here at the moment, other than the fact that Kikenya has been seen here a few days ago. Most of the other vehicles tend to spend their time along the river. Now, another interesting thing while I do have the map out is that if we move back down to the east over here, where she used to have her den site around Miles Turner Hill, it's quite interesting to see how far she's moved. She's moved about 15 miles along the Tanzanian border to the west to where we've last had her in this area. Now, I'm hoping that she is in fact still here in Kenya. You can see this is the border of Tanzania. And she does spend time in Tanzania. We haven't been following her too closely over the last year, so we don't know of her exact habits. But like I say, let's hope she hasn't crossed back south into Tanzania and she's just lurking somewhere here in the long grass. We're going to keep searching and I'm hoping before too long we will get lucky again. Well it sounds like Scott has been having a lot of luck up in the uh, in the Mara of late which is wonderful. Hang on, there were some contact calls. I'm hoping these lines roar for us. Let's listen. Yeah, that just a soft call not quite a roar yet but possibly possibly we may get a roar from these lions before the end of the show oh that would be ideal <laughs> oh bless you one of the lions just sneezed there's a paw <laughs> Another sneeze. Sure. Three sneezes. There we go. Come on. Little contact calls. Eh? Let's see. It's just that one male on the right that is calling. And those two still resting. At least that one's lifted, lifted its head now. Um, Craig, I wonder if I can try reposition for us. 
you know, they need to just try reposition quickly. But I think stay with us because these lines are showing signs that they're possibly going to do something interesting. So I don't want you to miss it. I'm just going to quickly go back this way. And I think we'll have a nice view of that one lion who's got his head up. Craig, let me know if I'm going to fall into a hole, please. <laughs> Go. Just hold on, Craig. I just want to give them a little bit more space. There we go. Oh, beautiful. That's a lot better than we can see these lines very clearly now. Now, this would be amazing if they decided to roar right next to us. Isn't that, that beautiful? Yeah, these lines, I mean, those manes pretty decent and again I'm not too sure how old they are but I would say they're close to five years old around four four five years old four years old I think but I'm not too sure maybe some of you back home can let me know it's always wonderful seeing new lions for the first time don't know where they come from um, Exactly, I don't, I'm not sure where this Evoca Pride comes from. I'm, I'm assuming somewhere around Thorny Bush, perhaps. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I, th I think I remember a friend of mine saying that they came from that side, possibly through Thorny Bush, Manialeti, down into this area. There are no males around here at the moment. All right, well, I'm going to stay with these lions again if they decide to do something we'll let you know but uh, there's another character that we would like you to meet well we would like you to meet another character we've had an astounding afternoon and morning of two leopards elephants we've had lions we've had tristan on foot which is enough to cover at least four or five different kinds of cats it's so entertaining but this week, making his world premiere on the Safari Lives show is not a cat, not a dog, not even a carnivore, but the world's most boring hippopotamus. We have a new character on this week's Safari Lives. Scuba Steve is possibly the world's most boring hippopotamus. He spends every day lying in exactly the same place. So how does an animal with the personality of a cardboard box find himself included in the lofty list of Safari Live characters? Well, Steve is no longer alone, you see. He seems to have found love. While it is early days yet, Bubbles Hook Waterhole has transformed from a bachelor pad into a love pond, and we eagerly await further romantic developments. Perhaps in eight months, two might even become three. Well, that's just a little bit of fun. Of course, we do play nasty jokes on, well, behind the back of old Scuba. He doesn't know that he's boring. He thinks that he's a perfectly normal hippopotamus, which of course he is. He's a perfectly normal hippopotamus. But we are very much enjoying the romance that's going on there with uh, Sarah. And time will tell whether they don't start their own little pod there or eventually go their separate ways. We have, of course, had a number of different hippo in that water over the last few years. Sometimes alone, sometimes with girlfriends, it may well be the same too. Uh, but we're going to we're going to pretend it. These are new characters to Safari Live, and we're going to watch very carefully as their little soap opera unfolds in front of us. Just a little bit of fun. And I don't mean anything nasty about Scuba. He is, of course, a normal why he lives there and nowhere else given that he is absolutely enormous I'm not really sure because I don't think at his size he would struggle to impose himself in a water hole such as Chitwa just look at that picture hmm. now Byron said that those lions are about 200 meters from us and I can't hear them calling so let's see if he wouldn't like to re-estimate that Uh, 
Um, James, I uh, yeah, possibly may like to re-estimate that. Uh, you are probably 198 meters away because I can see your leopard in the tree from here. <laughs> but um, oh, because they've got the spotlights on the leopard at the moment, let's see if you can see in the distance. Uh, so no, unfortunately because of the branches in the way. Um, but we we can see the light, the spotlight. Um, so yeah, you are that far away, James. <laughs> but yet these lines have not called. But but there are two heads up at the moment. So they are showing signs of getting more active and hopefully moving around a little bit. You can see that mohawk of hair that has formed. Not, so not quite a full mane yet. I wonder if we're going to get a, another little yawn. There has been a bit of yawning from these lines. Here we go. Amazing. It is really a wonderful experience to be able to sit with lions like this. Especially at night, it is, it's a, it's an eerie feeling. A third one just lifting its head now. There we go. Digital titbit, um, there, there are no females with these males currently, but these males will definitely meet up with females from different prides. Now remember, prides of lions generally are made up of the females and the youngsters. You will have young males in that pride. You may have a dominant male that stays within a pride. But what's happened for many years now in the Sabi Sands, in this area especially, we've had coalitions of males. So three, four, five, six males sometimes that tend to stick together and move around increasing their territory size, meeting up with females from different prides, mating with them and having offspring. So that's what these males will potentially do and possibly are doing already. But they will at some point challenge other males for territory, extend and expand their territory. There we go. Come on. He looks like he wants to. It's always this teasing sound of lions wanting to roar. But with all three heads up, the chances of it happening are a lot better. Well, again, I'm going to wait until the very end. <laughs> Let's go to Ralph, who's got a tiny nocturnal creature to show you. Well, here's one of our very common nighttime creatures, the little cape scrub here. And, well, he's just looking at us in the, uh, in the darkness here. And... Well, I've just returned from my leave, and it's been an absolutely um, uh, wonderful week, it seems, out here in the bush in the Juma Traverse of the Greater Kruger National Park. And we've got a little wrap um, to show you of exactly what happened with all the cats. Tingana the Duke came across onto Juma from Torchwood in the southeastern corner. Tandi was present in the central parts, later moving southwards. The Talamati pride made an unexpected appearance near the Juma camp, while Tlalamba was in a normal abode to the east. The Avoca males caused a commotion this morning, showing up with all of Tandi, Kuchava and Tingana. 
So, as I said, it's, uh, it seems to be an absolutely uh, blockbuster week um, here on, on, on the Juma and Chitwa and Torchwood uh, region, but mainly on Juma. Um, and that's why I always say in the bush, always expect the unexpected. Um, because before I left, it was actually relatively quiet in terms of the leopards and lions movement. But uh, in the last week and uh, before that as well, it seems like the bush is absolutely exploded with um, different sightings so uh, it's always uh, a different uh, perspective every single day you can expect something new to happen so um, well I'm just gonna keep on looking and tomorrow morning and exactly the same well James back over to you the little Leopardess in the tree, beautiful as she is, slinky feline, is now snoozing relaxedly. I think Tundi will probably leave her alone, but perhaps once we've all departed and things have quietened down, Guchava will slink down the tree and disappear into the darkness, and Tundi will turn around, head north, back to Chalamba. We certainly found Chalamba this morning, as Tristan showed you a little bit earlier. And so I'm sure Tundi will go back that way once she's uh, well calmed down a little and allowed this territorial dispute to dissipate. Well, that's an interesting, uh, interesting comment, James Richard. You say uh, Kuchava looks like the perfect blend of uh, Tundi and Mvula. Now, Mvula we're pretty sure is Guchava's father, if I'm not much mistaken. Now, I'm not mistaken, that is true. And I, you know, many people can see and recognize faces and animals better than I can. I don't see Mvula in her face, James, but I'm not saying that it isn't there. I certainly don't see her mother's face, I must say. I think she's got a much um, less, I've used this term before and I use it advisedly, uh, short nose, shall we say? P pug, pug nose? She's got a much longer nose than her mum's. She also seems to have... And I'm sure this isn't correct, but she seems to have fewer wrinkles on her face <laughs> than her mother does. Tandy and Shadow, uh, who were sisters of Karula's firstborn, they looked very similar. Shadow now passed on. But Tandi had a very similar look to her. I could definitely see the resemblance there. But Mvula, who at one stage was my favourite leopard, I can't see in this cat. Well, that's probably me. And James Richard, of course, can identify a leopard from, well, a slight visual of one spot on the hind left foot, which is a very impressive. So I'm going to defer to his better judgment and recognition skills. Now, sorry Kirsten, I think I missed something. Are we going to go back to Byron here or are we going to stay here and wait and see if we can hear the lions calling? Ah, I see, right, so we'll go back to the lions if they call. But at the moment they are what Byron loves to call flat cat. <laughs> He actually hates to call them flat cat. I don't know why that is. It's amazing. Byron has become quite a traditionalist in his old age. Old age, of course. He's uh, now 33, I think. That is just a gorgeous shot. What a wonderful day it's been. Many of you saying what a wonderful drive, and thank you for that. But what a wonderful day. And tomorrow, of course, we're at it again, Monday morning, nothing stops out here, nothing has a break, and so neither do we, and therefore neither do you. So 6.30 tomorrow in the morning until 8.30, we are still doing drone tests between 5.30 and 6.30, and if we do happen to come across a cat using the thermal drone we will definitely go live between 5.30 and 6.30 on Facebook so just keep an eye out for that in the meantime we'll be live from 6.30 to 8.30 in the morning
So that's very exciting. Sydney will have his second go tomorrow. Thank you, all of you, for welcoming him today. And he'll be on drive again tomorrow, along with Byron and Ralph, I believe. Thank you very much for joining us all today. It's been an absolute joy and a pleasure to share the highlights of the week. I really love these Safari Lives weekly shows, and I hope they will become an institution. Until tomorrow, stay safe and happy wherever you happen to be in the world. We'll see you as the dawn breaks in Africa.